But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Well, it's a memory I'll never forget. And um, if you're anywhere near my age, uh, you probably won't either. It was in the the TV room back in the manse in in Arla in Brisbane. Um, I was uh, a few months short of my 30th birthday on September 26, 1983. And uh, in the the morning when we woke up, we rushed to the TV. Can anyone guess what it was? Australia 2, crossing the winner's line. Yep, uh, America's Cup was won by Australia. I think it was 132 years America had retained Uh, retained it, nobody had taken it, and then Australia did. Coming from way down, they had to win multiple races in a row uh, to take the cup, and they did. And the whole nation erupted. You know, they say that with regard to uh, uh, the the race down in Melbourne, um, I've just forgotten the name of it, how's that? (laughs) Um, But anyway, with regard to, to that race, that it stops a nation. The Melbourne Cup, there it is. Just went blank. And the Melbourne Cup, it stops a nation. Well, I tell you what, when Australia 2 crossed the line, it more uh, um, than the Melbourne Cup stopped the nation. Uh, I still remember the Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, in that very you know, colourful, and wasn't colourful, but really, you know, over-designed jacket, um, said that any Australian boss who didn't allow his employee Uh, to take the day off or fired him because he did take the day off uh, was not a very nice person. He used a different word than that, but I won't say it up here. It was just this exhilarated celebration that just spontaneously erupted uh, because of what this nation had just witnessed and what had happened for them. It wasn't just what those sailors did, but it was for Australia. Australia also won. But as great as that was, it pales into insignificance when we think of what happened on Christmas. We're about to celebrate it. I think we don't do it often enough to try and picture what took place with the shepherds, say, for example. Shepherds, can you imagine it? Out in the fields, dark as anything, no lights around. Not like these days with electric lights and everything else. Pitch black. 
And then out of nowhere, this angel, a radiant angel with light shining all around appears to them. Must have just completely scared them to the wits. That's what the angel said, don't be afraid. Because they were. <laughs> and then this wonderful message of, of great joy that, that was being announced with regard to the birth of this child. They will know which one it was because he'd be found wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And it was declared that this was the Christ. This is what Israel had been longing for, for thousands of years. That's what God promised to Abraham, that through him, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Can you imagine the angels? Because we read not here on that one, but we read then when that message was given, that a multitude of angels, we don't know how many, but it was a huge number of angels appeared and sang that beautiful chorus, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favour rests. Glory to God in the highest. Think about it. Those angels would have been there at creation. They would have seen the fall. They would have heard the promise in the curse to Satan that a seed of the woman who would, would come and crush the serpent's head. They would see the call of Abraham and the continued promise all the way through Abraham's life. I don't know if you realize it, but, but about half a dozen times throughout different stages of Abraham's life, it's repeated the promise, through you all nations will be blessed. And then that wonderful promise to David. They were there when the promise was made to David that there would be a king who would sit upon his throne and he would reign forever. They were there in the days of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Can you Im imagine how they felt when Christ was finally born. They would have been ecstatic. They, they would have just sung their, 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 their wings off. <laughs> Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace upon men on whom his favour rests. But even that was surpassed when Christ rose from the dead. The song King of Kings, I think, captures what they probably felt beautifully. And the morning that you rose, what does it say? All of hell, heaven held its breath. Up to that point, this is what all human history had been working towards, the atonement for sin, once and for all. That wasn't achieved with the birth of Jesus. It was achieved with the resurrection of Jesus, not with his crucifixion. The price was paid, but victory was not won until Christ rose. Scripture tells us quite clearly, God raised him from the dead, and in that God is declaring to everyone that the sacrifice was accepted. If Christ had not risen, as uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we would be still in our sins. And of all people, we would be most pitied. The resurrection is even greater than the birth in terms of how significant it is. More important than the death in so far as it heralds the victory. And so we read further in that uh, song, and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe. The angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. We miss out on so much when we don't take time to think about the significance of these things. How would have the angels felt? And how did heaven feel when finally Christ rose and all things were put under his feet, all authority in heaven and on earth? were subjected to him. And so when we come to our text this morning, we're arriving at the most momentous event of human history and also of redemptive history. Redemptive history is the history of God bringing about salvation for the world and the restoration 
of perfection to our world. Remember it says that when, when Jesus returns and the books are opened and everything is finished and done with, then there'll be no more crying or pain, no more death. But most importantly, the curse is lifted. The curse that was placed upon the world by God when Adam and Eve fell into sin. Only at that point is that curse finally lifted. And so everything you find in the Bible, but everything in human history, no matter what history book you look at, everything is working towards this point. And so what we discover so far in, in the book of Revelation is that we have twice now gone back to the beginning with regard to the birth of Christ through to his return. Gone back again to the beginning with the, the trumpets, back to his return, because that's what happens with our, our um, reading today, our text today. We're back at the return of Christ. We've done that twice now. I've told you this book isn't chronological. It covers the same period of time three times. And we've now come to the end of the second time. And we were told that when it came to the seventh trumpet, that would be it. Remember? And that's where we're up to. The beginning of our text says the seventh trumpet was blown. Okay? What did we read in Revelation 10, 5 to 7? There'll be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. There will be no more delay. And then also when you take a look at uh, Revelation 11, 18, within our text today. It says, The nations were angry, and your wrath not will, but has come. And then it says, The time has come, again, not will come, but the time has come for judging the dead, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. This picture we have before us this morning is greater than the birth of Christ in terms of the momentous occasion. It's greater than the crucifixion. It's greater than the resurrection. Everything has been moving towards this point. And we're here today in this sermon series looking at it. I just hope and pray that when we leave here this morning, we've understood it. And we go on our way rejoicing with great courage, knowing no matter what happens, we've got nothing to be afraid of, for Jesus reigns. So like the angels, we seek to be in awe this morning. We seek to be in awe of the majesty, the power and the glory of God. And we seek to be in awe of his immeasurable love for us, his people. And we will note the joyful, exuberant celebration that befits the coming of the kingdom of God. So let's look at it. Let's have a look at this seventh trumpet. Our text brings us to that seventh trumpet and the third woe. We finished the second woe. Do you remember there are three woes? We're now up to the seventh trumpet and the third woe. It says there in Revelation 14, it pointed us towards it, the second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. And so it's with the blasting of the seventh trumpet that we are brought to the seven bowls of wrath. And we're going to be brought back to the beginning again, to the birth of Christ, and we're going to be taken right through to the end. But now it's not going to be a partial judgment. First of all, it was a quarter, then a third. But when we get to the bowls, it's 100% the wrath of God unleashed upon an unbelieving world. How do we know we're going back to the beginning, that this is the third time we're going back to the beginning, the same period of time? Remember, 1,260 days or 42 months or three and a half years? It's the same period, whichever way you, you calculate it. How do we know? Because when you go to Revelation 12, as we'll see in depth in our next sermon, we read of the dragon standing before the woman about to give birth. The woman's Israel. And the one who's given birth is 
or who you know is birthed is Christ. And when Christ is snatched up to heaven, what happens? Satan then concentrates on the children. Those who believe in the testimony of Jesus, it says. And he's enraged. And so the rest of the book of Revelation, covering the balls of wrath, depicts the severity of the coming persecution against the church. Because Satan didn't stop the coming of Christ. And therefore, enraged, he makes the church his target. That's how we know we're going back to the beginning again with the bowls, and it'll take us right through to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we uh, have a look at this uh, set of chapters coming up, just a little bit of a preview. We know it's the final judgment of God that's coming in, in these chapters because everything that comes now is from the temple of God and look what's involved. In chapter 14, 17, we, we read of the angel with a sharp sickle who comes to harvest the earth. Again, not a portion of the earth, but 100% total, the wrath of God falling upon the earth. The angel with the sickle, you know, that instrument that cuts the, the grass or the wheat or whatever. And then we also read in chapter 15 of seven angels who, who appear with the seven bowls of wrath. So there we, we see them with the seven bowls. And then in chapter 16, the command is given to start pouring out the bowls of wrath. And then in chapter 17, 1, we get the announcement that all is finished. And so what we find here um, in our uh, um, uh, text this morning and, and what we're looking at is just um, an outline, an introduction. But the rest of the book is going to give the details. It's going to fill in the details. So what do we have here then in our text today from Revelation 11, 15 to 19? I hope I've got you and the Spirit through me salivating. <laughs> so, oh yes, let's, let's hear what we have here today. Well, we've got this heavenly celebration going on. Like I said, bigger than the celebration with the angels before the shepherds. And even bigger with regard to what would have taken place with the resurrection of Jesus. What do the angels say? The kingdom of the world not will become, but has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. This is what the angels had been waiting for. And look at the 24 elders. They fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. In other words, it's been completed. Jesus has handed over the kingdom, and God is all in all, and he has begun to reign. Everything has been working towards this point, and here it is. What the world doesn't get and so many in the church do not get is that there has been this humongous war going on from the time that Adam and Eve fell into sin till the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. No war on earth, no physical war matches what's been going on between God and Satan. Whatever human misery you can dredge up from history and what you can put before me or anybody else, no matter what's going on in Gaza today or in Israel or Ukraine, matches anything like what's been going on throughout the history of humanity as to what has been the outcome of this war between Satan and God. Not only have millions died physically and sometimes in horrendous circumstances, but so many have died eternally, have died apart from God and will not live with him when Christ returns. That's the greatest tragedy. And that's why the angels are so exuberant. The kingdom of this world, that is the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, Jesus, will reign forever and ever. This is what the angels had been waiting for. 
This is what we pray for when we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Yes, back in Eden, the kingdom of God was handed over to Satan. And we've seen the consequences ever since. What you see happening in Ukraine, what you see happening in Gaza and Israel is the work of evil. It's the work of evil. What you don't see happening in places like China with regard to the persecution of Christians. What you, what you see happening to the Uyghur people who aren't Christians, but nonetheless what's happening to them is at the hands of evil. What you find unseen in Muslim countries with regard to the persecution of Christians is sheer evil. What you saw with regard to ISIS, what they were doing to Christians and non-Christians, anyone who disagreed with them, was sheer evil. It all started with the fall. And ever since then, God had been working towards the coming of Christ, this kingdom that would supplant the kingdom of Satan. Do you remember the seven churches that we started with in, the, in chapters 2 and 3? God told them that they were indeed, yes, being persecuted. He told them that they would suffer more. Some of them would be put into prison and more of them would be put to death. They were pointed in this book, as you and I now are, towards the fact that Caesar is not greater and behind him Satan is not greater, but Christ is greater. Do you remember the temptation they had to forego Christ and to just compromise with the world? It would be easier to start worshipping Caesar as God. And so this book was written to them to comfort them and to encourage them and to let them know no matter how desperate things became, no matter how strong it appeared that Caesar was, that Christ was greater still. That's the whole message of the book, first of all, to those seven churches. But it remains the message to the church today. You know, Psalm 2, we, we look at this a, a little while ago. This all was foretold. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. And I love, I just love this imagery. Here, here are the kings of the earth saying, we will rule, forget about God, we will do as we please, we're all powerful, we can do what we like. And what does God in heaven do? The one in throne in heaven laughs. What idiots. He laughs at them. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. That's back in Psalm 2. And here we are, Revelation 11, 15 to 19. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. This is the anointed one that Psalm 2 speaks of and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So what, what do we have coming up? As I said, this is basically an outline of what's to come. What we find here is just uh, an outline, but the rest of the book's going to fill in the detail. So what's coming? We find out who the arch enemy is. We find out who his servants are. Those he will use to persecute the church. Those who he still uses in order to thwart God's plan. You know, he tried to do that in Moses' day. In the command of Pharaoh to destroy all the male children. That was Satan's ploy to bring an end to, to the people of God so that Christ wouldn't come. In Esther's day, he did it again with a command to annihilate all Jews. What's going on today in terms of anti-Semitism? Well, just go back to the book of Esther. There was a command at that time that all Jews throughout the empire be annihilated on the one day. That was Satan trying to thwart God's plan. What about Herod with the command to kill all the children around two years of age? That was Satan's plan to thwart 
the coming of the kingdom of Christ. And so what we're going to see is in the following chapters, we see Satan, the enraged dragon in chapter 12. We'll see his servants, the beasts from the sea and the land coming forth at Satan's behest. We'll see the kings of the earth in, in the battle of Armageddon against the Lord and his Christ. We'll see the woman on the beast. We'll speak of Babylon, but we know from the descriptions it's speaking of Rome, the power of Rome against the church at that time, and representative of any power against the church in our time. And then finally, the last enemy, death itself. All these will be paraded before us and we'll see every one of them vanquished by Christ. And so here we are with this picture of the victorious Christ before these enemies are paraded before us. He's the one, remember, he's the one who alone was found worthy to break the seals of the scroll. Remember how John was devastated when no one was found worthy? And the angel said, oh, don't cry. <laughs> Have a look. The line of Judah is found worthy to break the scrolls, or to break the seals of the scroll. And of course, that scroll represents the rest of human history, the 1,260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, whichever. That's what the scroll represents, that period of time. Christ, Christ rose from the dead and won a decisive battle over Satan. Not the war. He won a battle. But when Christ returns and Satan is destroyed once and for all, that's when the war is won. And now for a church faced with the horrors of persecution and the temptation to compromise, to the seven churches, but now also to the church today, Jesus is shown to be the King of kings and Lord of lords and he not the kings of the earth and he will reign forever and ever but remember this whole book was given for the comfort of the saints these people being persecuted in uh, rome or in the in the roman empire in that part of the empire in turkey called in those days asia minor they needed comfort they needed courage. And first of all, doesn't that speak of the love of God for his people? He didn't just leave them there without word. He knew what was going to happen, but he didn't leave them in the dark. He knew how they were feeling. He knew what was the danger for them. And he gives them this book. He writes this letter. And he comforts them. Tells them, yes, you're going to go through worse times yet, but you're not on your own. I am with you. And whatever you pass through, yes, man may harm you. They can harm your body, but they cannot touch your soul. If you lose your life for Christ's sake, you will find it. That's what they needed to hear. That's what you and I need to hear. And look what we see in Revelation 11:18. The time has come for judging the dead, and for what? Yes, the dead are going to be judged. Everyone, believer and unbeliever, are going to be judged. Mind you, believers won't be condemned, for there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. The whole world will be judged, believer and unbeliever, but Christians will not be condemned. But it says here, the time has come for judging the dead, and, and here comes the comfort, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great. The time has come for rewarding your people. And not just the giants of redemption history. Not a person like, say, for example, Abraham, if you consider him a giant. Or David. Or Isaiah. Okay? Or in church history, Calvin, or somebody like that. Okay? Not one of those, or just those, but everyone from the smallest to the greatest. Whoever you are, no matter how insignificant you feel as a Christian, if you think your life is, is so unimportant that books won't be written about you, if, if in 100 years' time, if Christ hasn't returned, if people Google your name, you won't come up. If you think you're that insignificant, the Bible tells us 
the reward waiting God's people is the same. No matter how you're measured in terms of greatness or insignificance in the world. Isn't that something to take hold of? Before God, we're all equal. It's the same reward. In 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11, it says, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail or fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. When it says, make, you know, make your calling and election sure, it's not saying work hard enough and do enough things. We know that salvation isn't by works. But to make your calling and election sure, you have to make sure it's in Christ alone that you are founding or putting down as the rock of your salvation. And listen to that. You will receive a rich welcome into what? Into the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This kingdom of which... Revelation 11 speaks. So yes, a time is coming. We don't know whether it's going to be in the next 10, 20 years. We don't know if it's going to be in the next 100 or another 1,000. We don't know it would be another three or 4,000. As I've said before, people living in the time of World War I might have thought that the end of the world was near. I mean, within you know, 10, 20 years. When it happened again, but worse still, when tens of millions died in World War II, people would have thought then, the world's got to be coming to an end, surely, soon. We don't know. And Jesus told us it's not our place to guess or try and work it out. Not even the Son knows, only the Father. But what we do know is that whenever Christ comes, even with regard to his coming, we need not be unsure as to whether we will enter the kingdom. If we have Christ in our heart and we have faith in him and him alone for our redemption, we have that wonderful passage, and this is what I'll finish with in Revelation 21, 27 to 28. Speaking of Christ's return on the clouds of heaven and people scurrying, looking for cover in caves, calling upon the mountains to fall upon them, what does it say of us? At that time... They'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, you, the people of God, you, stand up. Don't scurry for cover. Stand up. Lift up your heads. Indeed, your redemption is drawing near. It's the exact opposite. Why? Because we've been waiting and praying for the coming of this kingdom and on that day that this passage speaks of, it has arrived. Don't be afraid. Stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption has arrived. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks. That in your word we have this wonderful passage of scripture. That indeed, Lord, we see that to which all of history is moving. And Lord, we, we thank you for the wonder and the adoration of the angels at the birth of Christ recorded with regard to their appearing uh, to the shepherds. We thank you too, Lord, um, that they would have felt the same and even more with regard to the resurrection of Jesus. And we thank you that in this passage we have record of the angels again singing praise to you. Yes, Lord, because Christ has begun to reign. And so, Lord, we, we thank and praise you that we have this to look forward to. If not in our own life, that Jesus returns, to know that uh, when we die, we don't enter into a vacuum. Uh, but as Paul has said so brilliantly, we, we give up this tent for something far better. That when we die, we go to be with Christ, which is better by far. But we long for the day when for all your people, those already who've passed away, uh, and those who will be alive when Jesus returns, that we can be together in endless, eternal worship, face to face, the curse lifted. No more crying, no more pain, no more death. In a world recreated, restored to its perfection, that the cries of creation itself, as we read of it in Re Re Romans chapter 8, 
that creation itself crying in labour pains, waiting for the, the day of, of God's people to be redeemed, that it too will have arrived for the world. And so we commit all this to you, Lord, and we praise you for your word that we've been able to, to linger over today. Help us to take time to reflect on these things and to understand the beauty and the significance and the power of what we've read, but also help us to draw the comfort and courage that you intend for your people to have. And again, we pray for our world. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to work out your purposes and that you will draw it to its conclusion and final peace once and for all, when evil will be destroyed once and for all, where Satan will be banished with all of those who follow him once and for all. We pray too for your word going forth, not only with gospel air, but also with treasure hunters and CVE and Kadu and, and other places. We pray for youth care as it continues its work in all the schools with chaplaincy and CVE. We pray that in this month, as so many young people are pointed towards the true meaning of Christmas, that the hearts may be stirred, the gospel may be planted, and a future harvest may be brought in. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, let's uh, stand and sing our um, next hymn, This Kingdom. This is what we've been hearing about all morning, This Kingdom. Let's uh, stand and let's uh, sing it together. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. 